Hey, 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 everyone. Hey, 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 animal allies. Welcome uh, to another educational and inspiring AAM program. Uh, tonight, Donnie Moss will describe past as well as ongoing animal liberation pressure campaigns, including the essential components and strategies that make up a successful pressure campaign, how to put together your own grassroots actions. And he's going to touch on and update his latest current campaigns in New York City targeting Adidas and HSNY and more. So my name is Michelle Granberg. I'm your moderator. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. I'm located in New Jersey, and I've been a vegan and activist for seven years. AAM is a multinational program supporting new and fledgling activists to reach their full potential. Our mission is to empower and equip activists to boldly participate in our global animal liberation movement. Founded in 2020, AAM offers a free three-month mentorship program, which pairs experienced activists with aspiring activists. Through one-on-one -on -one mentoring, we generate an increased number of effective activists worldwide because we know this movement needs more activists. Additionally, we offer free workshops that educate, train our mentors, mentees, and the public. We have a podcast called the Animal Liberation Hour, and we host large-scale in-person activism events around the country. If you're interested in applying to become a mentor or mentee or want to get involved or to donate, please visit our website, animalactivismmentorship.com. Cool, good deal. So, 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 so now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. In 2008, Donnie Moss made the award-winning winning film Blinders, the truth behind the tradition that documents New York City's controversial horse-drawn carriage trade. He also led a pressure campaign to compel the largest blood bank in the country to pay for the care of 66 chimpanzees who had abandoned with, that, with no food or water on an island in Liberia. Since 2015, Donnie Moss has been organizing pressure campaigns targeting individuals and organizations that are exploiting animals. He's a New York City-based animal rights campaigner who runs grassroots campaigns and produces video news stories for the animals' rights new website, news website, theirturn.net. Please hold your questions for Donnie until the end, and then you're welcome to put them in the chat. Uh, feel free to use the chat throughout this presentation, but please keep your comments respectful and on topic. All right. So with that being said, it's my pleasure to welcome Donnie Moss. And Donnie, pass it over to you now. Thanks so much, Michelle. And uh, what an honor to uh, be asked to do this. So, you know, several years ago, uh, another animal rights organization asked me to uh, make a presentation about pressure campaigns at, a, at an a animal um, conference, animal rights conference. And I said, oh, I'd be delighted. What's a pressure campaign? And they said, well, that's what you do. And so I didn't I didn't even realize that there was a name to the kinds of campaigns that I was running, but sure enough, they're pressure campaigns. And in my mind, a pressure campaign is, is what I've written here. It's a short-term high intensity effort to achieve a winnable goal. So it's not like ending factory farming or shutting down all slaughterhouses. They're more they're short, discrete campaigns with a very defined objective. Um, so I'm trying to advance, and I can't seem to be able to advance. Sorry about that. Hold on, let me let me escape. Sorry. Uh, hold on one second. Here, let's try that. Here we go. Sorry about that. So uh, the New York Blood Center campaign, which Michelle referenced a minute ago, this I'm going to start with this campaign and use this campaign as a case study um, and then get to the newer campaigns at the end, um, time permitting. So some of you might have heard that um, in 2015, the New York Blood Center, which is our largest blood bank in New York, probably in the country, abandoned 66 chimpanzees 
on islands in a river in Liberia after conducting biomedical research on them for 30 years. And uh, so I would just want to give you some background before I talk about the campaign. So this is the New York Blood Center. This is their headquarters in New York City. And in, in 1974, the Blood Center wanted to conduct research experiments on chimpanzees. And instead of doing it here in the United States, where there would be more regulatory oversight and where there's animal rights activism, they leased a defunct laboratory in Liberia and uh, they leased the laboratory and they hired hunters in Liberia to go into the jungle and the forests and shoot adult chimps and steal their babies and use these babies in research. And, um, and so that's what they did. And this went on really behind the scenes without, you know, people like us knowing about it. Um, and you could see here's a, a picture of a of oh this is actually so here before I so I'm just going to play a short video for you which gives which in which I'm interviewing uh, one of the people who raced to Liberia to take care of the chimps after they were abandoned and but this sort of sets the scene about what what these chimps endured um, when they were used in biomedical research so I just want to start with this Ned at the Liberian Institute for Biomedical Research where the chimpanzees who were abandoned by the New York Blood Center were subjected to experiments for 30 years. At the beginning, they were getting chimps from the wild, killing adults and taking the babies. They were also paying hunters to go out and trap chimps. Some people had them as pets, were bringing them here and selling them. They stopped doing that for the most part and developed a breeding colony. That was actually the best place a chimp could live here because they did get to be with other chimps and in a kind of small family, very small room, small window, very dark, but at least they got to be with other chimps. Sadly, those chimps eventually would be put back into the cages. When I started working here, they were all on team here. That happened, there were no cages. Like right here, one of the animals died right here. After a few of them hung themselves on the chains, they decided to build cages. This was an improved cage because you'll see a sliding door there so they could move a chimp out of the area to clean every day. Prior to that, they either would have to dart the chimps and anesthetize them to take them out just to clean the cage or clean the cage with the chimps in there and they were terrified. It was a prison. I mean, what else can you call this? Regardless of what was happening to the chimps or the research or anything that came out of the research, it's all metal, it's all bars, it's all concrete. The enrichment they would put in here might be a tire um, up in the corner or a hammock that was made out of metal. They never left the prison cells unless they were knocked down to go in and have research done. Okay, so I'll stop there. And uh, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit for you. Um, they used a, about 400 chimps over the course of the 30 years that they conducted experiments. Uh, hold on, I'm having trouble advancing again. Here we, oops. Hold on, sorry. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, let me get back to the slideshow. Oops, sorry, we didn't have these technical difficulties when the rehearsal. No worries. Just bear with me for a minute. Everybody's gonna hang right in there, no worries. Okay. Stuff happens. Play. Okay, so uh, the, here we go. So, so the New York Blood Center Conduct, this is just a, a photo from inside the one of the labs. They, they, they conducted research on these chimps and they earned hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties off of this research. And the people who conducted these experiments, uh, who worked at the New York Blood Center, they acknowledged that it was their responsibility to fund a sanctuary for the lifetime care of the chimpanzees who survived the research. So that was in writing and they made a commitment in 2005, when the, right around when the research ended. And so they moved the chimpanzees onto these islands. You can see where the red arrows are, which were about 
30 minutes away from the laboratory where they were kept in those cages that you saw. And they made a commitment to deliver by boat food and water to the chimps on these islands because there was no natural food or fresh water on the islands for the chimpanzees. And so once every other day, New York Blood Center sent their caregivers out, you know, like the, the guy who you saw feeding, giving water through the through the cage uh, to the islands with, and and to, to provide them with nourishment. I mean, abysmal, but better than nothing. This is one of the chimps named Bullet. He's, uh, I would say, more one of the famous, one of the more famous of the '66 chimps, because you could see he lost an arm when uh, the New York Blood Center, the hunters they hired, went into the jungle and and shot, you know, shot them. This guy lost an arm, and he survived the research and was retired and still lives on one of the islands. They didn't properly sterilize these chimps, so some of the chimps had babies. Sadly, uh, because again, this is not this is not a setting where you would want not not their natural habitat. You wouldn't want them giving birth here. In 2015, the New York Times reported that the New York Blood Center changed its mind and decided to stop funding their lifelong care, and literally a just abandon them. This was during, if some of you may recall, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Liberia was among the hardest hit countries. People there were dying. And that's when the New York Blood Center made the decision to stop funding the chimps. They thought, you know, the world is focused on Ebola. No one's going to pay attention to these chimps. Well, thankfully, what they did became, you know, we, we learned about it and we took action. So here's an image of the chimps, you know, at the, they can't swim. Chimps can't swim. Um, they sink. And so here they are sort of wading into the water as they see a boat arriving with food. So they they claimed that the chimps were Liberia's property and their responsibility, and they refused to meet with advocacy groups to discuss the issue. And so I took it upon myself because I'm based in New York City to, first I called them, of course, no response, letters, no response. And we did a peaceful protest out front of course, they ignored us. Jane Goodall, you know, took a photo telling the New York Blood Center to keep their promise. Uh, okay, here's another video. Hopefully, we don't get stuck again. And then we went inside. We escalated. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that was our first sort of, that's the first time we sort of uh, trespassed onto, I would say, private property to do a protest. It was an escalation. And then Jane Goodall, you know, posted about it on social media too. And we thought, you know, this would be enough to get the blood center to say, okay, we're going to 
we're going to look at the, this more closely, but that didn't move the needle. And so then we did a massive protest at the New York Blood Center's annual gala. You could see on the left that the police had us barricaded or wanted us to stay in these barricades far away from the main entrance. But then we left the barricades and um, and we we did a moving picket. I mean, there must have been 100 of us or more. People came in from all over the country for this. And um, and you would think that would be enough still. It wasn't enough. So that's when I really put sort of, okay, we need, we need to launch a pressure campaign. In any campaign that I do, I always ask myself the question, what are the objectives, strategies, and tactics? The objective was clear. We wanted the New York Blood Center to pay for the lifelong care of these chimps. And the strategy was we're going to disrupt the lives and the reputations of the decision makers who are who have abandoned them and the tactics you'll see, you know, and so the strategy always answers the question of how are you going to achieve the objective? And that's how we're going to do it through these kinds of disruptions and, and a compromising reputation. And then the tactics answer the, or how do how are, you, how are you going to disrupt the lives and reputations of the decision makers? And so that's what we'll look at here. A pressure campaign, even in a pressure campaign with the targets, you always start politely and professionally. We send a letter, I, you know, drop off letters with doormen before we show up and protest, give them the opportunity to meet with us and talk with us and invariably they ignore us. Uh, in a pressure campaign, at least I found, we're not trying to make friends or allies. We're not attempting to change public behavior. This isn't like vegan outreach or, you know, it's not that kind of thing. We're taking provocative steps to fulfill our objective. And our objective here was to get them to pay for the care of these chimps on an emergency basis because they were abandoned and left in the care of locals who didn't have the money to pay for their care weren't shouldn't have been responsible and were as i said they were living through an ebola outbreak and so what nerve for the new york blood center to abandon them and leave these these people with this responsibility so at first we started targeting board members uh and we went so howard milstein is a multi-billionaire as you could see in new york city who lives on park avenue and he was the chairman of the board so we thought let's start with him first and we went to his home on park avenue uh, tons of police. I mean, and they tried to tell us that we couldn't be on the public sidewalk and we refused. We said, you know what, go ahead and arrest us. We know our rights. We know we're allowed to be here. And we stayed on the sidewalk right in front of his door. We didn't let them intimidate us. We did die-ins. Uh, we got media coverage, uh, much to our surprise, actually, the real deal, which is the real estate um, rag in New York City, everybody in the real estate industry reads this uh, publication. They did two stories about our protests at his home. And then we went to his home in the Hamptons, which is a few hours away. And in this colossal mansion that he lives in happens to be next door to a public beach where people were waiting in their cars to get in, into the, you know, waiting in line to get into the parking lot. So we reached hundreds of people. Nevertheless, we, we learned after I would say a month or two that this man is shameless and that he doesn't care. And there was no amount of protesting that was would move the needle. And we decided to shift to another target. Uh, this was another board member. Uh, her name was Lori Glimsher. She was the Dean of Cornell Medical College. And she lived in the condo that you can see on the right, which was just a few blocks away. And we thought this is a perfect person to protest because we could protest both at her at her place of work, the Cornell Medical Center, and at her home in the same night. During business, you know, at the end of the day, as everybody's leaving, we could protest and then we can move over to her house and everyone, and as everyone's coming home from work and going into her building, we would catch people. And so we created these posters juxtaposing her face next to these starving and abandoned chimps. And that in and of itself is so disrupt because, disruptive because nobody wants to see an image of themselves next to animals and be accused of animal abuse. And right away, we could see that this was having an impact. People coming out of the building were really upset. They didn't want to be uh, filmed. This guy, I don't know if he was an administrator or a student, but we caught him on camera saying, kill the chimps. Yeah, made a video, put it on YouTube of him saying, kill the chimps. And he was so upset 
that we caught him on camera doing that and pled with us. And so it just it, it was just so disruptive right away. And that's what you're looking for in a pressure campaign. You're looking to disrupt and create so much chaos that your target sort of throws their hands in the air and says, what do I need to, to, to do to, to get rid of this? So I'm going to show you maybe a minute or so from a protest uh, at the uh, Dr. Glimpshire's place of business uh, and this is this one went was a little bit nuts. Bring Lori out here to say that she'll reinstate funding for the chimps, and then we'll go. Reason we're targeting Lori Bluescher is because she's on the board of the New York Blood Center, which, as everybody knows, abandoned 66 chimps in Liberia with no food or water. <laughs> When we arrived at Cornell Medical College, where Lori Glimpshire is the dean, we noticed that no one was leaving the building. Then, students who were sympathetic to the cause informed us that people were being diverted to another exit. When we attempted to protest at that spot, Cornell security guards used their bodies to block us and claimed that the sidewalk, where hundreds of pedestrians were walking, was private property. I'm going to have to use force on you guys. She's starting to get hands We are allowed to be here, everybody. Do not let them intimidate you. We are on public property. We can march here if we want. The person you should be going after is Laurie Glimpsher. She is the one who has 56 chimpanzees to die. A building line is there. It's public up. property. Yeah. It's a state public street. No, yes, it is. It. So I, I edit these videos in such a way to, to, to show the most chaos possible. Because again, if I'm Lori Glimpsher, I'm asking, right, as I said, we, we wanted her to see the chaos caused by her actions and to say to herself, what do I need to do to put a stop to this? I can't have these people showing up week after week, generating this kind of chaos and also holding up posters of me next to these chimps and giving out this information Surely she was saying to herself, this is humiliating and I have to put a stop to it. I'll play another just minute or so from another video where we were at her home. And here she is. It must be horrible for her to be in front of her own building and see a dozen or more protesters chanting loudly, disturbing her neighbors. She can't possibly want us here, which is why we're going to keep coming back until she reinstates funding for these chimps. Yes.
They're here to be their voice because they've been left with no food or water. In anticipation of this protest, Cornell has had to create the curtains for all of its windows to ensure that the guests at their reception don't see our posters. One of our, our we're just trying to get them to reinstate them. So you get the idea. This, you know, sort of go, well, this, uh, oops. So uh, I, Again, I, I edit these videos. I'm not a professional video editor. I use the editing software that came on my own computer. If I could figure it out, anybody could figure out how to do just this sort of basic video editing. I just take clips with my camera at these protests. I dump them into my computer and bring them into the video editing software that came with my computer. And, and you just drop the clips. And it's really, it's amazing how easy it is to video edit once you've done it a few times. But again, I was creating these, these videos so that Glimpser said, what do I have to do to stop these protests? And eventually she resigned from the board, but that wasn't what we were looking for her to do. We wanted her to reinstate funding. So that, that was not the outcome we were looking for. Uh, and so, you know, we said to ourselves, what do we do to escalate this even more? And I just want to point out here um, that I think in, well, in life in general, and particularly in these campaigns, change happens in the discomfort zone. When, when we're uncomfortable as activists, when our targets are uncomfortable, when all of the people around us, like the people who you saw in those videos covering their faces are uncomfortable, that's where change starts to happen. If we're outside protesting peacefully, if we had been outside protesting peacefully at these events, nothing would have happened. It's only because we wreaked so much havoc, which is, which is again, why these pressure campaigns have to be short and um, and really focused, because this type of activism is really not sustainable. So we really stepped out of our comfort zone. I, I don't know if Rachel Ogden is on, uh, is on here. I saw she signed up, but she was one of the activists who participated in this disruption where Lori Glimpscher was uh, receiving an award and making a presentation in Philadelphia. And I'll, I'll play just a minute or so of this. Uh, because this was really a game-changing event. Can I have your attention, please? Dr. Lori Glimsher abandoned 66 chimpanzees on islands in Liberia after experimenting on them for 30 years and earning $500 million in royalties off of the research. <laughs> The chimps who can't swim off these islands were left and starved to death. Dr. Winston's decision to be gone from the blood center and learn to escape the animals did nothing. Yours, the pleas of Jane Goodall, who sent two letters to her organization asking them to feed these chips. Please do the warning. Lauren, the truth. Um, 
Anyway, so this uh, that went on for a few, a few more minutes. It it we it could not have been more disruptive. And and it's you know looking looking at this, you might say to yourself, God, that seems too confrontational, that's over the top. But it was it was stepping out of our comfort zone and doing this type of disruption that ultimately led to a victory in this campaign. But we didn't stop at Dr. Glimpsher. Uh, we. Uh, we targeted uh, another blood center uh, board member who lived in lived in uh, also lived in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. His name was Michael Hoden, and we we decided we were going to go after him too. Uh, we of course sent the polite letters and we did the petition. We did everything right. I dropped off a letter at his home, I, you know, and of course he ignored us. And then we escalated. So I'll play just another minute to, to sort of more of the more of the same the kids chaos. Kids every night, so shut the fuck up. Oh, every night. We did it earlier for months and months. It didn't work. Right? This is clearly working. All those calls are coming in. It's making a difference. Maybe the blood center will listen now. What do they need to do? I've gone gladly to the kids' shifts. So you could see. We started going during the day, and then over time, as we weren't moving the needle, we started to go at night, and that's when neighbors started to get really mad, and we felt badly about being there. We didn't want to disturb the neighbors, but sadly, we knew that we were going to have to be there at night and be really disruptive in order for Hoden to say, oh my God, again, what do I have to do to make this stop? And of course, we let him know what he had to do which is to reinstate funding for the chimps who they abandoned after making $500 million off of them and making a pledge to provide them with lifelong care. Um, another super chaotic, I, I won't play another one, but a super chaotic protest uh, at his home. Oh, wait. Uh, and so we wanted Michael Hoden, just like Lori Glimpshire, uh, the doctor, to see the consequences of his action, that this the disruption, the chaos, the reputational damage. In fact, just as a sidebar, I was in um, California during, you know, during this campaign, and I met somebody who worked in the same industry as Michael Hoden. So Michael Hoden was on the board of the New York Blood Center, but that wasn't his job. He was just a board member. And I said, I said to this guy in California, uh, who I met at a dinner table, um, have you, um, have you, do you, are you familiar with Michael Hoden? And he said, I know all about the chimps. And I was stunned because I hadn't said anything about the chimps. I don't even under, I don't even know how he knew to say that. But his colleagues around the country were clearly aware of this campaign and what he had done. And that told me that well, we were making a difference. But again, I can see how somebody watching these videos, which I intentionally edited in such a way to show utter chaos, would be upsetting for some people. We wanted to expand the reach of these protests, obviously. Uh, so we created these videos, as, 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 which is what you've been watching, to, to, to show the chaos and to compromise the reputations of the people we were targeting. And we were, we were targeting their networks too. So if Michael Hoden worked in, let's just say the insurance industry, I'm just hypothetical, then I was contacting his colleagues and the, the companies that he sold insurance to or bought insurance from, et cetera, I wanted to embarrass him 
and exposed what he had done among his peers. So we had an we had a Facebook page called New York Blood Center Do the Right Thing, and it and we were very active on that page, and the page got a ton of engagement, and so we were able to create these online actions to augment what we were doing in the streets and what we were doing with the videos, and that enabled other people around the country who couldn't participate in you know with us in the streets to have a voice in this campaign. And that was really helpful. You know, having all of these people supporting us really made a difference because sometimes, you know, it's, it's, um, it gets upsetting, you know, when you're outside doing these disruptive protests and everybody hates you and everybody's screaming at you, you know, it could feel, um, it's upsetting, but to, to see the support from other activists was, you know, uplifting. So in addition to targeting the board members of the New York Blood Center, when we realized that that wasn't gonna be enough, we started to target their corporate sponsors. And they had three very big corporations that gave them a lot of money or in other resources. And those were MetLife, IBM, and Citigroup. And our hope was that we could convince them that they should pull their funding from the New York Blood Center or use their influence as major donors to get the blood center to do the right thing. That was what we really wanted. We weren't looking for them to pull their funding. We, we really just wanted them to use their influence to get New York Blood Center which is a very wealthy organization to just reinstate the funding. And so we reached out to all three of these corporate donors. MetLife was the biggest. You could at one point they gave $250,000. There was a MetLife sponsored blood center vehicles driving around Manhattan. They were huge. The partnership between MetLife and the New York Blood Center were huge. We started politely. We delivered this petition uh, to somebody in their public affairs department. You can see a photo of the, the, the chimps with their hands extended. Um, uh, that's Bob Ingersoll, who in and of himself is a, a very famous chimp advocate who came in from um, uh, San Francisco. And then when that didn't work, we started to protest outside, you know, because again, these, these uh, campaigns are an escalation. And when that didn't work, we went inside the lobby and I'll play a minute of this. They have refused for a year to speak to the countless people around the world who have contacted them and asked them to be a voice for the chips. You've left us with no joy, but to disrupt the people. Met like silence equals death for these chicken thieves. You're driving food and water. Well, we got to leave, right? <laughs> So they are an activist. They're the people who are leading chimpanzees to starve to death. So please go inside and arrest the real criminals here. Dennis White, Nandika Madagascar, and the CEO, Stephen Kandarian. How do you put your head on your pillow tonight knowing that you are supporting an organization that is starving animals? Okay, so you, you get the idea here too. You know, I intentionally include footage of onlookers, of, you know, confused security guards who don't know how to handle us, footage of police trying to get rid of us, but not seeming to be able to, and probably not wanting to arrest the 25 people, or however many of us were in the lobby. So they're trying to figure out how are we going to handle this because they're not leaving. Die-ins, moving pickets, just again to show as much chaos as possible so that MetLife has to ask itself, is our partnership with the blood bank more important to us than shutting down these protests? Or, or maybe we should contact the blood center and say, fix this, fix this and make this right to get just if for no other reason to get rid of the activists. Because the executives at MetLife clearly didn't care. The board members clearly didn't care. So we had to engage in tactic. What do we have to do to make them care? So we compromise their reputation. We disrupt all of these things. 
That's what makes them care. And I just, I get it, just, I stopped the video inadvertently on this letter. I sent handwritten letters to all of our targets. So they knew we were coming. We were very, we're, we were very polite until we weren't because we were ignored. We also, the, it just so happened that the back of the MetLife building was a public plaza where a lot of MetLife employee, a beautiful plaza where people had lunch from the MetLife building, from other buildings. And so we would go at lunchtime, this was during the summer. And so there were teachers who had off and you know activists who didn't have normal you know working hour schedule. We got a lot of people to come out and just be super disruptive on this public plaza. And again, MetLife has to ask itself, this is where our employees eat lunch. Like this is their time of day where they're supposed to relax and look at what's happening. We were just, we were so loud and chaotic on this, uh, on these public plazas. And you could see the security, MetLife security talking with the NYPD, trying to figure out what to do to get rid of us. They said, oh, this is private property. You can't stay and, and, and very well might've been, but we said, this is a public plaza. We're not going anywhere. And they, they let it, you know, they didn't arrest us. So we stayed. And then we decided when MetLife wasn't moving quickly enough for us, we were going to go to the home of the CEO of MetLife, Stephen Kandarian. And he lives in a very posh suburb in New Jersey called Summit. And we caravaned uh, out to, to Summit and we paraded through the town. And I'll, I'll play a minute from this video too, so you can see what happened in Summit. This is Johnny Moss, the Veritor.net at the New Jersey home of that life CEO, Stephen Kendarian. <laughs> Mr. Kendari has refused to answer any of our calls and emails. So he and his company have left us with no choice but to protest at his home and his community. <laughs> Both of the people that I've spoken to have said that they're not surprised that he's involved in this, that he's not a nice man. <laughs> So we wanted Kendarian to see that we were not only protesting in front of his house and educating his neighbors, but we were marching through the very quaint and quiet downtown summit where he lives. You know, we we marched there. It was only you know maybe a half a mile away from his house. We were we were speaking to people who were sitting outdoors in restaurants. You saw us, you know, holding up the posters to people in restaurant windows, and we we couldn't help but think that Kendarian would say to himself, you know what? Our relationship with MetLife is not worth this personal attack that I'm experiencing now, and uh, you know, and so, you know, again, well, what is he thinking? And that's what that's what we were thinking that he was thinking. It's just not worth it. And sure enough, MetLife issued a public statement after careful review. MetLife suspends financial support of New York Blood Center, urges long-term solution for Liberian chimpanzees. They caved into pressure. They did not do it because it was the right thing to do. They didn't do it because they had a discussion with us. 
Um, they didn't do it because they're compassionate. They did it because we showed up at the CEO's front door and embarrassed him. And sadly, that's what it took. But again, we were we were focused. We were laser focused on our objective, which was to get the New York Blood Center to reinstate funding. So uh, the second, so the sec uh, another target was Citigroup, and Citigroup we reached out politely, and we didn't have to protest Citigroup because they called me in an, in for a meeting, and I brought another activist who was working on the campaign. And we made a slide presentation to them um, in their in their boardroom. Three very high level executives. I couldn't believe how senior the people we were meeting with were. And they they decided they didn't want to be subjected to protests. And they issued a public statement before before any protests, saying that they had the opportunity to meet with representatives from their turn to discuss the care of the chimps. Uh, they received copies of the petitions. They made a powerful presentations uh, of the passions this issue raises. And we have great respect for the voices they symbolize. Um, anyway, and so on and on, uh, this, the current situation is not tolerable. And we urge all parties to come with a sustainable situation to ensure that these chimps get the care that they need. And just want to stop and point out here, this is somewhat unprecedented. Corporations don't sort of cave into pressure like this. And I think it's because of the provocative tactics that we uh, you know, were employing with the other targets. I think that they saw what we were doing and made the decision. They didn't, they didn't wanna be subjected to that. I guess it's conceivable that they truly were moved by the presentation and the petition. And of course, I'll never know what really motivated them, but you know, uh, and in any case, they, they made a, Oh, I, I didn't include this. They made a $50,000 donation toward the care of the chimps. We didn't even ask them to do that. We didn't even necessarily want them to do that. We wanted the New York Blood Center, which earned you know, hundreds of millions of dollars off these chimps to pay for their care. We were just as happy for City Group to give their charitable money to, an, to another organization, not for the care of the chimps. And then lastly, IBM. And so I contacted IBM and IBM responded, very quickly, and I had an in-person meeting with IBM also, and they said, we're gonna, we hear you, we're gonna speak to our colleagues at the New York Blood Center, and we are gonna look into this ourselves, and we are gonna get back to you with a decision about what we're gonna do. And that dragged on for months. And I gave, I gave my contact there, their head of corporate affairs or public affairs, a, sort of a warning that too much time has elapsed, and she didn't move, and, we did this. For the odd hand of completion and the abandonment of 66 chimpanzees on islands of Liberia. We are here to demand that IBM end a strategic alliance with the New York Blood Center, who's committed this moral crime. We are here to demand that IBM fulfill this promise to hold the New York Blood Center accountable. To shut down the New York Blood Center facility in its building and replace it with a blood collection organization that didn't break by the New York Blood Center. We waited for months while Sheila Apple promised that she would take action, but she was stringing us along duplicitously. <laughs> I can't do the right thing. IBM, we're going to go to Arma. We're going to go to other IBM office buildings until IBM fulfills its promise to take action against the New York Blood Center.
the woman who you saw, the contact that I had, that woman, Sheila Apple, um, you saw a photo of her for a second. She strung me along for, uh, I, it felt like months. I don't remember anymore, but she might not have ever done anything. And then we showed up here, did this protest. And within days, IBM issued this public statement. Um, terminated funding for the 66, uh, oh no, while, while the New York Blood Center provided care for a period of time, it terminated funding for the 66 surviving chimpanzees, transferring the financial burden for their care to animal welfare organizations that had no involvement in the research. Our company strongly urges the Blood Center to work with the government of Liberia, Humane Society of the United States, and other charitable organizations to find sustainable long-term solution to ensure the health and well-being of the chimps. While IBM does blah, 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 we've suspended its support of the New York Blood Center blood drives in New York, while the New York Blood Center works with all deliberate speed to implement long-term solution to this issue. Again, IBM would not have done this had we not shown up and done that disruption inside their lobby. I would even argue that if we had stayed outside and done the protest outside, they wouldn't have moved. But again, we'll never know. Anyway, the day after that protest, that woman from corporate affairs contacted me and said, you knew we were working on this. Why did you do that? And I said, because you you weren't acting in good faith. You strung us along for months. You knew the information and you were just stringing us along. And um, oh, this this is what I was saying before. The slide is just out of place that Citigroup donated $50,000 to support the chimps. Um, anyway, we had a victory. The New York Times reported, I think on May 30th, uh, that the blood center reached a deal to help care for the research chimps. Two years after the New York blood center set off a storm of protests from animal welfare advocates by withdrawing support for a colony of chimps used for research, the organization has joined with the Humane Society of the United States to guarantee their future care, pledging $6 million. So our, our pressure campaign um, compelled the blood center to make a donation to the Humane Society of the United States to oversee their care on, in Liberia. And the woman who you saw at the very beginning um, giving a tour of the cages, she had been hired by the Humane Society, she and her husband, to move to Liberia on an emergency basis to take care of the chimps after they had been abandoned. And it was people like us who were funding this for for two years until the pressure campaign ended because they made this commitment. And the Washington Post reported that the research chimps were abandoned, then a battle over their fate began. And again, reported on, on the $6 million settlement and, and even mentioned IBM. Most recently, IBM said that it suspended support for the center's blood drives in New York until it implemented a long-term solution for the animals, the youngest of which could live for 40 or more years. And so that's the end of the slide. I just I just want to observe that if we had done this the way that the mainstream public would have wanted us to do this, petitions and letters and standing outside with politely and distributing information, they would never have cut a check for $6 million. It was only the chaos and disruption and angry neighbors and embarrassment and reputational damage that led the New York Blood Center to write this check for $6 million. So it was an ugly campaign. It was an unpleasant campaign, but it demonstrated that these tactics are effective if you have a discrete objective. And, and you know, and in this case, it, it was kind of urgent. And so that's why we employed these tactics. I'd much rather be polite and engage with people and do vegan outreach and help move, you know, help move people uh, along in their in their um, advancement of a cruelty free lifestyle and all of that. This was not that. This was not that kind of campaign. This was a pressure campaign. So with that, I guess uh, Michelle, we could open it up to questions. Unless I've yeah. scared everybody away, or you scared everybody? No, no. I think they're all still sort of really soaking it all in, as am I, and just really floored by everything that you do and and all that went into this and what a great example of a pressure campaign it really is and it's so funny how you said before you're doing pressure campaigns without having a a name for what you're doing but you definitely refined it here and so we are opening up for questions folks i'm going to check the chat here so feel free or a comment you would like me to pass along to donnie uh, or a question um, not seeing any questions yet, but Donnie, maybe could you, you know, with 
you know, it looks chaotic. Like you said, it looks so chaotic, but I know behind the scenes what, you know, it's so well planned and so well organized, like sort of how much time and energy and research and um, thought w- went into this. Do you think like a full-time, was it a part-time job for you <laughs> sort of, or was it like a full-time job? And would you do anything differently looking back? Good question. First of all, there was definitely a method to the madness that you saw in the videos. I mean, I intention we intentionally create the chaos because we know it's the chaos and the disruption that's going to move the needle. Having done pressure campaigns before that, I just had a sense that the more chaos we demonstrate, you know, we displayed in these videos and and in person, obviously, the quicker we would get to a solution that, you know, to fulfill our objective. Um, I also just want to point out that this was not an expensive campaign. Um, those posters that you saw, I feel, I think I might've only paid $6 each for those posters. Um, and there were really, there were just very few expenses associated with this campaign. I learned how to do the video editing myself. Um, and, uh, and I just, you know, you cobble it together. Other activists are supportive. They get on board. They see that we're organized. They want to contribute. It just worked out. You know, you saw that protest, that took place in Philadelphia. I reached out to activists in Philadelphia and they so willingly um, and kindly volunteered to participate in that disruption that took place in that room that looked like a library where Dr. Glimpser was giving that presentation. Um, and so, uh, so people really rallied. Um, it was a compelling story. The protests were compelling. Our objective made sense and, and people just rallied around us. Um, would I do anything differently? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say the one mistake that I made, um, and, and it's not a big one, and I've definitely made big mistakes in other campaigns, but uh, the, is that city, when I, 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 um, I put up a petition targeting Citigroup before I sent them a polite letter. And so when they called me in for a meeting, they said, you know, why don't you give us the courtesy of contacting us and giving us the chance to do the right thing before you put up a t- petition? And I said, you're right, and I'm sorry, I should have done that. But I guess I I guess from experience, I knew that companies don't respond to that. They don't, that's not what motivates them to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. It's the chaos and the disruption and the protests that motivate them to do the right thing. But I, I didn't dot my I's and cross my T's. And, and um, so that was a mistake. I'm sure there were other little errors throughout, but that was that was the one that comes to mind. Awesome. Yeah, we have some questions coming in, coming in now. But I don't know, Johnny, also could you say like, is there a critical mass of other activists that you think you need to have with you? Does that make a difference or is it more the intensity and the strategy of it? Or does it also good to have a minimum or maximum, you know, amount look like there was 20 there average 10 to 20 each time. I edit the videos to, uh, to suggest that there are as many people as there as possible, if not more people. You know, there's so much you can do in editing with the music that you heard, with that intense music, right? When you watch the raw footage, none of it is nearly as intense as it is when you then put the music on it and all of this other stuff and the sound effects. Um, so uh, yeah, it, look, there's power in numbers. The more, the more people you have, the better. If it's 20 people on the side of MetLife lobby refusing to leave, the police are going to be much less likely to arrest us than if there are just two people who refuse to leave. Um, I have to say I, a couple of things that I'm jogging my memory. Um, I was surprised that no one did arrest me, especially the billionaire who is the um, heartless chairman of the board of the New York Blood Center, Howard Milstein. And by the way, they cleaned house after this campaign. The chair left, Michael Hoden left, Lori Glimsher resigned because she wanted no part of this. She didn't think, she didn't realize we were going to keep coming after her even after she resigned. And um so everyone who we targeted was gone after this campaign. So there was some sort of reckoning that took place. Um, and uh, like I, to be a fly on the wall. Oh, my God. Wouldn't I, and some people got let go, I guess. The, right. <laughs> I guess. Maybe, uh, the other thing that I would uh, point out is that we there was a mole from the one from the from the early weeks of this campaign until almost the end. And that was keeping me up at night because I did not understand why they knew I was organizing these events privately, often without even a private event page on Facebook, sometimes just by like DMs. Yet they knew when we were coming and there was a, one shot with a, a guy with a semi, you know, sort of a consumer video camera, not a phone, but a video camera in my face. 
or in the videographer, you know, one of our faces, I don't remember who had the camera at the time, but the billionaire chair of the board of the New York Blood Center hired four security guards and they followed us. They were all over the place and we did not know how they were there. And so I figured we had a mole and I couldn't figure out who it was. And it turned out to be someone who on the at our first protest at this guy, Howard Milstein's apartment on Park Avenue, you saw one activist holding a single sign in front of his apartment. Um, this guy saw, said, I want to join you and showed up all the time and was one of the best activists we had. He did wonderful outreach in the streets. He came inside the MetLife building with us. He was great, but it turns out he was a mole. And, um, and so that was a huge source of stress. But ultimately, we figured it out that he worked for a private security company. And I did a test. I organized, I pretended to organize a protest and I, and I BCC'd everyone including him, but he was the only person I BCC'd. So I said, dear all, and he was the only person I sent it to, we're going tomorrow. To, and so, and the security team was there. So I knew it was him. Uh, and so anyway, that was like a, a source of stress, but you could see, I mean, if they felt that they needed to hire a security company, yeah. that's you, that's how you know you're making a difference. Yeah. And that was only a few weeks into this. Oh my gosh. It feels like this would make a great movie. So many twists and turns and drama, but we've got a bunch of questions Donnie, for you in the chat. So let me get to those. Um, from Testify Redeem, how do you choose a target for your pressure campaigns? Good question. And so uh, we look for the low hanging fruit. So we knew we wanted, and for the New York Blood Center, first we went, you know, our target was the blood center itself, but we quickly, after a few protests, realized that that was going nowhere. So then we went after individual board members. And so we, so who are the board members that live in New York City? Who are the board members that live in neighborhoods that have a lot of pedestrian traffic, um, who are near a subway stop, who we think would be personally uh, upset by being targeted by protests? So we profile the different board members and we we pull it, pick the ones who just met the most criteria. So Dr. Glimpshire, the chair, the um, dean of Cornell, she checked all the boxes. You know, she worked at a, a at a medical school where there was tons of traffic in and out of the building of her colleagues. And there were tons of medical students, some of whom hopefully were, you know, progressive minded. And there was, uh, and then she lived just a few blocks away. So we were able to protest at her her school or the medical school and then walk just a few blocks to her house. And, and it was like we were feeding two birds with one scone with each of those protests with her neighbors and her colleagues. And so we knew she was a great target. And likewise, Michael Hoden, I showed you a clip of a video with and his neighbors were livid because we were going there at night and we saw how angry everybody was. And that that told us this is working. We need to keep doing this. I felt badly. Again, I, I didn't like being disruptive to the neighbors, but to be fair, it was one hour once a week. But the way the neighbors reacted, you could have thought we were there for four hours every night. And so I, part of me wondered if some of these people were screaming us, at us, and there were a lot of people screaming at us. I didn't show all the videos, but that at that apartment building where the video was shot in the dark more than anywhere else, we just probably over the course of the 15 protests that we did there, probably you know dozens of people screaming at us and we caught it all on camera and and of course Michael Hoden is watching this and saying oh my god I'm the source of all of this chaos in my neighborhood uh, this is unsustainable I've got to do something I can't have this level of disruption and embarrassment and online embarrassment and my colleagues and my professional uh, you know and so that that was the thinking behind um behind who we picked wow it sounds exhausting, but that's all part of it. But it's, that's why you hopefully want it to be short term. So another question, next question from Matthew Lobin or Lobin. Do you have any, any advice for the first steps in a foie gras campaign? Would you consider trying to meet with the chef? Yeah, you know, and there's there's a book called Foie Gras Wars. It was one of the first books I read when I became an animal rights activist. And it was, it was about just this. It was about a foie gras pressure campaign. And the book was written by a reporter, I think from the Chicago Tribune, who was reporting on this foie gras pressure campaign, which was taking place, I think, even in another city, oddly. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but I would highly recommend that book if you want to do a foie gras campaign. And uh, yeah, you would, the, the first step is to send a polite letter to the chef or the owner and, you know, and 
and and then you start to escalate. Then you you know you follow up. Maybe you knock on the door of the restaurant and say, "Listen, I'd like to just quickly have a, have a discussion with the chef, and and you, uh, with the hope that you could show the video footage of of how the of gavage of the force feeding." And then when they won't do that, you protest outside, and then eventually you take it inside and disrupt their their disrupt during dining hours. And it's unpleasant and it's not fun to do that to to diners who are spending a lot of money to go out for dinner. But sometimes that's what it takes. Mm. Absolutely. So next question, um, Josh Baldwin says, I'm afraid of going after people and instead of focus and instead of focusing on institutions, I'm afraid of harassment charges. Were you scared of this? Did you plan around the possibility of harassment charges? So you know what? That if you ask me, Michelle, what one of what the other things I would have done differently is I probably would have gotten uh had a lawyer on board from the very start. There are animal rights lawyers in New York City. There are people who I could use as sounding boards. There are people to call. But, um, you know, I feel like there is more of that even now than there was when I ran this campaign from 2015 to 2017. So I would have a lawyer on board um, and everyone should have a lawyer who they can call um, in the event of, of an arrest. Um, I, uh, to be honest, I guess I was a little bit surprised that the, in particular, the chair of the blood center that Howard Milstein didn't try to do something legally. Um, and I, I guess after a while I saw this, we're, they're not doing anything. Maybe it's because what the blood center did was so egregious that if they arrested us and this somehow got media attention, that it would shine an even bigger spotlight on what the New York Blood Center had done on the abandonment. And so maybe that's why they weren't coming up after, of a, after us legally. But I guess my advice would be to have, you know, a local lawyer or two, of, you know, consult with you. And, you know, and, and it's just never too early to do that, like in advance of. Right. Almost. I don't, I can't, you know, it's hard to go back in time and remember. I don't think I did that in the way that I probably should have. Okay. So another, the next question, how do you determine how much chaos to introduce? I guess you sort of were saying it, if they're not listening, you know, right? if they're not acting. I guess, you know, I said there was a method to my madness. You know, I knew that we were provoking, we, we wanted to provoke, and it's, I, and it's, I hate saying it, that we had to do this. We wanted to provoke these angry reactions from neighbors and colleagues and whatever. We, that's what we, we knew we needed that in order to achieve a result. Um, and so the chaos, you know, it kind of happens organically, you know, when, you know, we don't, we're not proactively nasty to anybody. We, we never are, at least I, I, I would advise against that. But in the heat of the moment, when people scream at us because we're protesting at night for an hour, then if they, then we can engage back and capture all this on camera. And that's what, what creates a chaos, but mm. we're not, we're not proactively nasty to people. I would never encourage, there's, there's just no benefit to that. I'm not looking to recruit. Look, we did want the neighbors to yeah. call Michael Hoden and say, listen, or, and call the blood center. And we told them, all we're asking you to do is call him or call the blood center and tell them to do the right thing. We did want them to do that. But in general, in these pressure campaigns, we're really not looking for the support or engagement of locals because mm -hmm. I'm, 999 9, times out of uh, out of 10,000, nobody's going to do anything. So we don't rely on that in a pressure campaign. We're relying on ourselves to create this chaos and get that chaos into the public domain so that their targets see what's happening if they're not looking out their window directly. That's fantastic. So we're open to a few more questions. We still have some more time, but I have a question then, Donnie. Like, how important is it to name names? Like, you know, how, how effective, you know, when you have the, how do you get their photographs? And is that really important to have their photos of the targets and their names? And was that sort of maybe what pushed them over the edge a little? You know, it's hard to know exactly what pushed them over the edge. I'm guessing that after three corporations, after three multinational corporations issued public statements, basically condemning their actions, I mean, that's pro that was the tipping point because after IBM issued their statement, that was that was the end. MetLife, Citigroup, and IBM, that was the end. Um, so with regard to names and faces, yeah, you have to name names and you have to put juxtapose their faces on posters and, you know, and whatever you use online, on graphics that you create online next to the victims of, of, of their abuse. 
you know, and I learned that because I once worked for a corporation, a multinational corporation in public affairs. And I can recall activists protesting our company. And I remember the head of public affairs came to me and showed me a picture of, of, of our CEO juxtaposed next to a picture of somebody dying of a disease and said, you, you should, this is terrible, Donna, you should have prevented that. As if I had any way of preventing what activists were doing in front of our building with posters. But that's when I knew executives don't want to see their photos, any target, any people don't want to see their photos juxtaposed next to animals and accusations of abuse. So even if you never even show up at their door, just by virtue of putting that online, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and I could tie this into a local camp, a uh, more recent campaign. Many of you are familiar with the kangaroos are not shoes campaign. Uh, being led for the Center for a Humane Economy, which is a Washington, a Washington DC based advocacy group. And so I volunteered to do some protests uh, at Nike first uh, because they were selling, they were probably the biggest seller of kangaroo skin soccer cleats. And so we were protesting inside the stores and they were super disruptive and we did a bunch and the videos were great and they went viral on TikTok with millions of views. And yet they weren't, they weren't, eliminating their use of kangaroo skin. And then I scheduled a protest at the home of a board member in New York City. She was the chair of the Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility Committee of Nike. So she wasn't a Nike employee, but she was the chair of a committee on Nike's board of directors. And she uh, was a young professional in her 40s. She had two young children. She lived in Greenwich Village in a, in a very busy neighborhood. Uh, and, and it worked for, worked for CVS, um, and, you know, as a, as a very high level executive and, and we were tweeting or, uh, uh, and, and copying, tagging CVS and, and then we announced we were coming to her house. Well, two days af long after the post, you know, after the posters were made and we were all set to go two days before the protest, Nike announced that they were going to stop using kangaroo skin in their soccer cleats. And so. Well, I'll never know for sure that that it was that home demo. It was preventing that home demo that motivated them to make that announcement. But, it, you know, the timing, you know, the timing was suspicious. And so, again, it, whoever asked that question, yeah, it was her name, her face juxtaposed next to kangaroos hanging upside down who were skinned for soccer cleats and and the imminent protest at her apartment. We think that that's, you know, could have yeah. been what led to that victory. And now we're- Yeah, but it's multiple, thing. multiple things, multiple times over time. Obviously that's what, that's the nature of pressure, 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 building, yeah. building. You don't know what's next. So there was a question here uh, from Sean Kennedy. What are the four to five most chaotic things you do that are still legal? Well, legal, I mean, I guess as soon as we, I mean, you can make outdoor protests, which are legal, mm -hmm as chaotic as you want to make them. You can go at night um, until it's not they- not illegal to be chaotic, in other words. Well, it's not illegal right. to be chaotic. I mean, right. you know, but the police, at some, you know, it, de it depends on who's calling the shots here. The police could decide that public disorder, they could, if they want to arrest you, they'll find a reason to, they'll find a charge and then, you know, and then arrest you. It didn't happen to us in this campaign. And we- couldn't have been more disruptive and chaotic. Mm. Um, and so I guess you have to sort of test out the local law enforcement and see what the limits are and see what your level of comfort is. Um, look, an arrest at a protest like that is not going to be a felony. It's probably going to be some sort of desk appearance. It could very well be dismissed. You know, I had, I've, I've been arrested a couple of times, you know, one time for trespassing. I was, you know, trespassing inside of a horse carriage stable in New York City. And I just had a desk appearance and the whole thing went away. Um, and so, but this is where I said earlier, you know, I about stepping out of your comfort zone, because if you're willing to step out of your comfort zone, that's where change really happens. But, you know, it's, yeah. it's you're out of your comfort zone because you're then taking risks. But as I said, in that whole two year campaign, we really pushed the envelope. You know, you saw that library protest in Philadelphia. I mean, they could have called the police and you know, and had us arrested and they didn't.
Yeah, we want to remind people that that Donnie is certainly not a lawyer. And as he said, it's always good to consult with a lawyer before, during and after. But, you know, this all goes under freedom of speech to some degree. But there are are there limits to that? Well, again, I would also point out that you're not trespassing until they tell you to leave. Mm -hmm. And so you could go inside and protest. And if you decide you don't want to take a risk, then you could leave when they say you're trespassing, you have to leave. For this campaign, we really pushed the envelope and we stayed inside of MetLife, but you saw there were police there and they didn't know how to handle us. And and we found that over and over and over where police would be inside the same thing inside of the IBM lobby. I feel like they were confused about what to do with us. Um, And it could be because, you know, we were 20 people and, uh, you know, so yeah, there is power in numbers as as I referred to earlier, but yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's such a thing as a like a failed animal rights campaign or is it just that activists give up too soon or just aren't strategic enough or well yeah i mean how do you how do you how do you define success and how do you yeah. define failure i mean well success is a win but well we were time. we were defining we were t- hitting the pause button to sort of celebrate the little victories that we were what we got all along like when met life was the first Actually, I th- w- w- whichever corporation issued the first public statement sort of condemning the New York Blood Center, that even though that wasn't the six million, the millions of dollars that we were looking for to feed the chimps, that was in and of itself a little victory that we could sort of celebrate because we could see that we were having an impact. When Lori Glimpshire resigned from the board, we could see that our actions ha- were had positive consequences. You know, again, we didn't want her to resign. We wanted her to give money you know, not herself, but from the blood center. But we could see that there were these little milestones and that we were, those were little victories and they was, were st- demonstrating that we were making, having an impact. And also I will say, even if that $6 million never came, we did, we did hold New York blood center's feet to the fire. We taught them a lesson about behaving so selfishly. They're not going to do something like that again. We did educate a lot of members of the public about the bad behavior of an organization and other organizations would have seen that and said, we don't want to get on these people's bad side. We're going to do the right thing in the first place. So there were like benefits all along, even if we didn't get have that ultimate victory. But of course, that's $6 million is that's what we that was our objective in the first place. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, you have your your platform, your news, you know, website, their turn.net. And we'll put that in the chat again for people certainly to join it. Now, did you create that? So you'd have a platform for what you were doing with the, with the chimpanzee campaign, like which happened first, the, the timing wise, was it the website and then that, or, or the other way? It was, uh, it was the website first. I wanted to report, you know, uh, uh, I always hear Jane Velez Mitchell, you know, who used to be uh, an anchor, anchor yeah. on CNN. Yeah, and, she was uh, in your video, Jane. Oh, right. Yeah. Unchained, she was there. Unchained TV for everyone who for, correct. And so she in. she would always talk about how the mainstream media doesn't report on the animal rights, despite the fact that billions of animals are killed each year in these horrific ways. That it, it's just like the mainstream media, because of their advertisers, mostly because of their advertisers are Arby's and McDonald's and you know meat and dairy companies. And so a part of my motivation to set up that website was to what, as I'm using her words, it was an end run around the mainstream media it was to give a platform to animal mm-hmm. rights for animal rights news that wasn't being reported by the mainstream media. But then when I was running my own campaigns, of course, I was using that platform to uh, to report on my own campaign. And then t- to my surprise, these stories started to come up in Google searches. So s- let's just say you were to Google at that time, Lori Glimpsher and click on the news tab in Google, all of these stories would come up about Lori Glimpshire abandoning chimpanzees from my website. But like, I'm not a particularly gifted web programmer or anything like that. It's sort of a basic website. So anybody can really do that. And I guess if enough people click on it or something, it starts to come up in Google. And so these people, if they have Google alerts set up for themselves, we're seeing these stories coming up, right? Like Lori Glimpshire doesn't want people doing a Google search on her and having these stories come up and these pictures of her next to dying chimpanzees, you know, left to die. And that was part of, that's part of the, you know, compromising their reputation and part of the chaos and part of the disruption is, is all of that online stuff. Yeah. Wow. The internet is a powerful tool. 
right? Yeah, if we harness speeding up our activism, definitely we harness things happen. Yeah, I mean, social media when it you know was egalitarian when it first. I mean, now you have to advertise and pay and all of this stuff, but at the beginning, especially. We could really animal rights activists really use the social media platforms to to you know in an unedited way. I mean, now they cover videos and all of that, but at this time it was it was actually a bit better than it is now. Nevertheless, we should absolutely use our social media platforms when we're working on any campaign, whether it's a pressure campaign or just vegan outreach or anything else. Here's two sort of related questions. How do you keep up morale with those participating in the campaign if it's taking a long time to win? And during the chimp campaign, which win along the journey was the biggest morale booster? Boost. Um, good question. So how do we keep up? More, you know, you might have to remind me of the second question. But uh, how do we keep up morale? Um, you know, I, we did social stuff too. And we would do uh, we would do debriefings after. And sometimes we would get together and have a bite. And I would update people um, by email, uh, you know, with news about the campaign. And I think people felt invested and engaged. And they saw that as the campaign organizer, I was organized. I was organized sort of in the streets and online. And I came with good visuals and good handouts. And I think people, and, and then they saw the little victories, you know, the MetLife and the City Bank and the Glory Glimpsure. And, the, you know, the New York activists saw the disruption in Philadelphia. And I think people felt really invested in the campaign. And so I guess that's how we, um, that's how we were able to persevere in the face of a lot of negativity, because as you can see from the, the videos, these are negative, you know, they're, you know, protests. They're, you know, they're not what we want to be doing, but mm -hmm. we, we had to. And which win was the biggest morale boost, I guess for you personally, or maybe for the group? Um, good question. The biggest, um, I think it was MetLife because MetLife was the biggest donor and had the most, um, it was most tied into the New York Blood Center. And it was the only company that wasn't engaging with us. Hmm. And, you know, and because we did those protests in front of MetLife, inside of MetLife, on the plaza behind MetLife, where, you know, people gathered for lunch and whatnot. And because we went all the way to, you know, to New Jersey, to a suburb, you know, and, 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 because, and I think we did that twice because of all of that. I think the MetLife announcement was the biggest one. Uh, yeah, it was, it was MetLife. So how can people get more involved if they want to, whether they're local in New York city or whether they're not local in New York city, what could they do to support your campaign, your current campaigns, which is Adidas. Yeah. And, uh, H S N Y. And do you want to say anything about those campaigns? Um, sure. So um, uh, very briefly, uh, the Adidas campaign is, is that's a part of the kangaroos are not shoes campaign. And so we had that victory with Nike in, in March of 2023. Um, thanks to the organizing of the Center for Humane Economy and Animal Wellness Action, which are you know behind the kangaroos are not shoes campaign. Um, in March of 2023, Puma and Nike announced that they would stop using kangaroo skin. And a couple a week or so ago, New Balance announced. And so the only massive sort of sportswear giant that's a holdout is Adidas. Adidas is a German company. Its four board members are based in Germany. And so we don't have um as we don't really have great targets here in the US. And so, but we're we're committed to continuing to uh, disrupt business inside the Adidas store. And I know that they're having Im an impact because I've heard from employees who have been, um, you know, em employees are not supposed to engage with us. They have strict instructions to not engage because anytime we're in an Adidas store during a protest, you hear like supervisors telling employees, do not engage, do not engage. In the meantime, we have all this footage of employees giving us the finger and, you know, yelling, you know, saying her ridiculous things to us, which we include in the videos. Um, and because that in and of itself is disruptive. So yeah, this is actually a little bit of a good case study too, because this is a bit different. So, so with the Adidas protests, I'm editing these videos, which are also super chaotic. And, you know, we're interviewing people inside the stores, customers on the streets, um, all of this stuff. And the, the purpose is because I want Adidas's PR department 
uh, to see these videos and say, this is not good public relations for us. I want their security department to see these videos and say, we need to increase security measures. They're human resources people to say, why are our employees continuing to, continuing to engage despite being clearly told not to engage? Mm -hmm. Do we have to do more employee training? Do we have to update the handbook? Then you've got the retail sales experience people saying, we want our retail customers to have a good experience. So I inside the store, a good shopping experience. So I got some a customer on video saying, I'm just trying to shop and you're making it so unpleasant for me. It was like, I, I just wanted to kiss that guy for saying. Yeah, that's gold. Like, Right. And, 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 and their legal department, you know, what is the liability? Well, how are they liable if there's some sort of incident inside the store during one of these protests? So you've got all of these different departments. So when I edit the videos, I've got all of these different departments in mind and they have to be, or I would like to think having worked on the inside myself at a company that they are asking themselves is is, is the incremental profit that we make by selling kangaroo skin versus trans transitioning to a cruelty-free alternative, is it worth all of the extra work that we have to do and all of this chaos, all of the legal, PR, HR, security, is it worth all of that marketing? And so that's a calculation that I think that they're probably making in their heads, but we're not there yet. They have not, mm. as far as we know, they haven't moved an inch. And now we've got activists in Germany and I think in Belgium who've seen the videos and say, well, we want to do this where we are and we have Adidas stores. So now there, there have been other protests in Europe. And so hopefully this will grow. And at some point Adidas will throw its hands in the air and say, oh, okay, it's not worth it. It's just mm -hmm. not worth it. And of course, activists in Australia are doing this because kangaroos are native to Australia. So they're particularly outraged <laughs> by the mentality associated with the kangaroo, you know, these nocturnal kangaroo hunts and the killing of the joeys and all of that. And they're so grateful that activists on other continents are participating in this campaign. I'm like, they're, they're animals. We're, we want to support all animals who need us. It doesn't matter what, what continent or country they live in. Mm. Yeah. So we're hoping there's going to be a victory there soon. And certainly people can reach out to you if they want to get involved with you, or if they want to start campaigns you know, in their city. So we're going to, we're going to wrap up shortly. I'm going to take just one more question from the chat, and then I'm going to ask you one question and then we'll wrap up this part, but folks don't go anywhere. If you can hang out, I have a few announcements at the end um, as well. Can you suggest a couple effective recruitment strategies? Well, you know, I build relationships over the years with local activists and, you know, we're on the front lines together at, you know, the, on Saturday, I guess that's in two days from now, I'll be at a protest for happy, the elephant being, you know, incarcerated at the Bronx Zoo. And so I, you know, I've been in the streets, been at other organizers protests for years. Um, but, you know, even if I was just starting out, I would go to other protests, become, you know, uh, uh, make friends with other activists, build trust, and then eventually organize on my own. I um, mean, that's probably how I did it, you know, back in 2006, when I became sort of a grassroots animal rights activist myself. I don't think I necessarily organized my own campaigns right away. I did other stuff and helped other campaigns. And then I guess the time was right for me to organize my own campaign. But yeah, you need to have yeah. those relationships. You need you to know? network and build relationships, authentic, genuine, you know, longstanding relationships over yeah. time. And, and, and also- It's not, it's easy to do anyway, because I'm telling you, animal rights activists are some of the best people. Right. Anyway, I'd be friends with them anyway. I'm telling you. And be organized. I would say and I was be organized and stay I in would, touch. I always showed up on time. I had good material, good posters for everybody. I had banners. I had handouts. And people wanted to contribute financially. Other activists. I want to, you know, and again, none of this was particularly expensive. I think, you know, an activist said, I'm going to make photocopies in the office, in my office and give. So people want to help. Um when they see that a campaign has a, you know, is organized yeah. and thoughtful and, and is having an impact. Speaking of wanting to help, you mentioned that Jane Goodall actually knew about the campaign and did some little bits to help. And did you get, what was her response, the, you know, when there was a, when there was a win? Oh, I didn't speak to her directly. So I don't, I don't actually know. Oh, so you don't I, even know? I don't know, but I do, I, you know, uh, I'm sure she you should reach grateful. out. You should, well, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm sure she was grateful. Um, Absolutely. She's so dignified and, you know, and, um, you know, diplomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, it could very well be that she sent an email thanking us. I don't really remember. Um, but yeah, sure. It was super helpful to have her hold up a sign, 
you know, New York blood center, whatever, to yeah. do the right thing. Uh, but, and, you know, you would think that would be enough, right? Well, Jane Goodall is this international, she's like a living legend. She literal. is. She's an icon. And, and when Jane Goodall is saying, do the right thing, you would think that these organizations and individuals would say, okay, we can't have Jane Goodall coming after us, but no, that, that was just, that was at the very beginning of this campaign. It took two, about two more years before the blood center caved into the pressure. Yeah, because as you said, you can't force people to care. Right, you know? no. no. So, any any final words, Donnie, before we wrap up? I'll... Yeah, I mean, I well, one thing is, uh, if you want to get involved in the uh, kangaroo campaign, kangaroos are not shoes.org, uh, I think. Um, and if you live in New York, of course, I'd love to have you at our protests. Um, and if you live in a city with an Adidas store and want to do your own protests, I'm sure that would be great. I'm sure that we can get posters to you and handouts. And, you know, the more people who are doing this in different cities, the quicker that Adidas will cave into the pressure. And I guess, I mean, my final thought I would say, and I know I've said this before, is to be willing to step out of your comfort zone because that's I found that's really where the change happens. Mm. If everybody's comfortable on our side, on their side, nothing changes. Love it. So folks, you know, who are still with us, feel free to use the chat right now to any takeaways that you're going to walk away with, any actions, you know, calls to action that you're going to per- you're going to work toward now, any words of kindness for Donnie and, and your other attendees are welcome uh, in the chat. But Donnie, thank you so much. Hold on. Let me just do a few closing announcements before we say good night here. And the announcements are um, our upcoming workshops, um, AAM workshops. Uh, On October 26th, we have Reverse Psychology as Effective Outreach with Michael Davis. On November 2nd, we have How Animals Grieve with Barbara J. King. On November 10th, we have plant-based diets for companion animals. On November 16th, we have the plant-based treaty and more to come. And please check out our previous workshops, all archived on our YouTube channel. And while you're there, while you're here on our YouTube channel right now, please subscribe and share. Uh, Please consider becoming a patron by finding AAM on Patreon. Your donations allow AAM to continue to provide educational resources like this for activists, which ultimately saves more animals. And that wraps up another AAM workshop. Thank you, Donnie, for your time and wisdom. Thank you all for being here and the tireless work you're doing for animals. And then again, if you're interested in being a mentor or mentee or want to get involved, please reach out to us. Um, If you'd like to be on our email newsletter list, you can let us know. That's pretty much it. So until next time, thanks everyone. Stay strong and live vegan. Thanks, Donnie. Thank you so much for having me. Yay.